Oh wow, we are oh, alive. <laughs> we are alive. <laughs> well, if you stuck around and actually waited for us, it's very exciting. Thank you so much. So Facebook made a whole bunch of changes and I guess we did not anticipate that. So very sorry for such a <laughs> delayed um, live stream. But thank you so much for joining. Nevertheless, um, this interview is going to go for an hour and is going to be recorded. My name is Olga Volatina. I'm uh, um, the chair of the San Francisco Bay chapter of the Sierra Club and long-term activist and volunteer in, in uh, environmental and political spheres. And I am excited to welcome today Linda Weiner, who is amazing person. I love working with her, love her perspective. And her background is absolutely mind-blowing. She, uh, I'm excited to uh, talk about the social um, um, uh, social work in LA. I'm, I'm excited to talk about the civil right movement when she was engaged in 63, 64. She worked for KQD as associate producer for seven years. Then she worked for, um, I'm going to go down the list because Ellen, <laughs> I couldn't memorize all of that. American Lung Association. Um, she worked for public health department. So extremely diverse background, Bay Area Air Quality Management District Association Council. So um, a lot of very uh, interesting connections there, I hope. And uh, we obviously talked a little bit before the interview and um, I, I just uh, uh, really mind blowing experience. So without further ado, Linda, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate you uh, also for having the patience. This is the first time it's happening. So there's first for, for every time. So thank you for joining. And maybe we can start. You were born and raised in uh, Miami, Florida. And then you made a journey to Bay Area. Um, uh, so so tell, tell me how the journey started and why did you decide to come to Bay Area? <laughs> Well, actually, I was born in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, but we had a move after two years to Miami for, for the climate, for my sister's health, which worked out. But so I was raised in Miami, Florida, um, and I lived there until, uh, you know, I went to college, but although I went to college in Florida, but, you know, growing up in Miami was unique in many ways um, that it, you have to really think about your formative years in terms of how they affected you in your later years. But Growing up in a tropical climate was pretty dramatic. Um, and that was sort of what really started the path in thinking me about the power and beauty of nature. But when you're in a place like Florida, in, in a second, you can have the weather will change and you can have dramatic thunderstorms that pierce your ears and your eyes and uh, raindrops are the size of peaches. They come down in sheets. You can't, the rain comes down in sheets. You can't drive. And then literally when it's over after 15 minutes, in three seconds, the sun is shining. So it, it's very dramatic. And um, of course, the key is humidity because it's suffocatingly humid. I mean, it's gorgeous. Everywhere you go, nature is abounding in terms of gardenias, poinsettias, hibiscus, avocado, um, insects the size of, you know, grasshoppers are the size of a serving spoon. We have cockroaches that fly. I mean, there are many different... Not the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> there are many different positive, uh, interesting aspect, aspects. And of course, the Everglades is in an astounding place. So the weather was really something you don't forget. And of course, we were close to beaches. So for us to go for the weekend to my, I was raised in Miami, to go to Miami Beach was, our father took us every week. So um, growing up in that kind of a climate really made me appreciate nature in a way. Um, the two things that stand out from Florida was the influence of nature and the issue of racism. Because um, uh, I got a small scholarship to Florida State University and I went, it was in Tallahassee. Uh, Tallahassee is deep south. It's on the panhandle of Florida, sort of like Alabama and Georgia. It's, you know, the South will rise again, the good old Confederate boys. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, uh, that was a lesson. <laughs> um, in my junior year, at, at a civil rights demonstration one night, one of my co-activist friends said something about the fact that Florida State had a, an exchange program with the University of Massachusetts. So I set my clock, got up early, went down the next day and applied for that 
program. So I did go to UMass for a year in Amherst. But to answer your sort of question before about the civil rights movement, it was, um, it was in 63 and 64. I forget, I was sophomore or junior. Mm -hmm. um, and spurred by the civil right, national civil rights movement, the Unitarian Church sponsored people to go and picket and all the restaurants where black people were not allowed to enter the restaurants. So, you know, separate bathrooms, a whole Southern mm -hmm. awful Gothic picture. Um, so I, I saw these picketers and I thought there was no way I could not do that. So I joined the group and we picketed about, um, I guess about, I don't remember, two or three times a week um, for several months. Uh, people screamed at us, said horrible things, spit on us. Um, you know, it was a little scary, but it was frightening, but probably more frightening was just the sheer injustice. Um, so that kept us going. I remember a couple times at night, we would go to some open field and all hold hands and sing, we shall overcome. But, and that was not cliched because we needed that to help us overcome the fear and to think about of us as doing this together. So I did that for on and off for three or four months. Um, we also, it was an integrated line in that Florida a and which is a black university was close to us. And some of those um, black students came over and joined us. So that was my memory, but it's something you don't forget. When you see that sort of um, racism up close, when I finished college, um, one of my friend's uh, parents brought her, bought her a Volkswagen bus. So we went across the US in the bus with her dog um, in the deep South, went the Southern route and you know, we really did see racism in many ways, but anyway, we stopped at the Grand Canyon. Um, I'll get back to the racist thing shortly, but you can stop me at any time to ask questions. I'm just uh, rambling on here. I mean, I, I, I and why, uh, completely frank, I did not, not personally meet people, or maybe I wasn't really asking, you know, uh, who participated in that moment. Um, we have a lot of conversations now, and I have a lot of conversations with different people. And one thing that people do not understand a lot of times, how recent everything it was happening, you know, just 60 years ago, less than 60 years ago, and how brutal and how terrifying everything that was happening was really so you know when i'm watching documentaries and when it's so vivid and you know freedom writers and it's horrific so so whenever people asking me well you know it's, it, it's been 60 years ago i was like no it's been only 60 years ago and watch the video and watch what was happening and still happening so so that's why i think it was so it is so valuable for, for me personally i'm hoping for everybody else to hear firsthand what was happening, how was it happening, and what you experienced? You know, and um, yeah, I mean, it's, I had never experienced that kind of hatred before. I mean, sort of the vein popping, screaming, irrational uh, fear. I mean, that people were so insanely racist. It, it made no sense. And of course you think it's not a rational thing because someone's skin is a different color, you're acting crazy. But anyway, the point is, the civil rights activists and freedom fighters were what kept us going because they were really brave. I mean, they were they were putting their lives on the line. But it, anyway, so we that was that was clearly um, an important factor in my growing up. But then, as I say, I left and traveled across the country. We stopped at Grand Canyon. Um, we did meet races along the way, and we just dealt with it as we could. But at any rate, and then we ended up that journey ended up at. Um, Yellowstone, because we had jobs as waitresses at Old Faithful. <laughs> so I worked at Old Faithful Lodge for three months, maybe more, as a waitress. And what a place to work. I mean, on our days off, we just had any number of gorgeous hikes. Um, and also during the summer, I worked at other, to keep myself going, so I had to put myself through college. Um, I worked uh, at Tanglewood Music Festival in Massachusetts. I think that was in the Berkshire Hills. or um, That was beautiful. And then I worked at uh, in the Catskill Mountains. So all of these summer jobs kept me going. Um, uh, the, the attachment to nature and to outdoors was um, was enhanced when my husband and I got together. And he was um, much more into bicycling and hiking and camping and um, than I was. And and uh, that was great. So that really that really kept us going. That was fun. And we 
you know, we went all over California. I mean, California is such a cornucopia of gorgeous nature, but, you know, I, obviously Yosemite, went to Yosemite many years, 10 times, because I don't know if people are aware, but they have this, it's closed this year, the first time in the history, um, a camp, southern camp, summer camp called Camp Mather. Um, and it's a great place to bring your kids. And we brought our son and you're in cabins, very basic cabins with centralized bathing, centralized dining, but you were uh, like very close to Hetch Hetchy. You were up in the Sierras. So it is a gorgeous it's place. Not the, it's not in the Yosemite Valley. No, it's, okay. right. Um, we went cross country skiing at Bear Valley. I mean, we, we did a lot of that sort of outdoor stuff, which my son to this day continues to do. He makes his living doing outdoor Wow, I, what, what does he do? He's in Canada, right? You mentioned. Yeah, he is in Canada. Um, well, he got his master's in environmental studies. Uh, he works, he, um, during high school and college, he engaged in a sort of an X game sport, which he excelled at and competed internationally. And so. What kind of sport, I'm so sorry? Pardon? What kind of sport? It's called downhill racing, where you go down curvy mountain roads on a long skateboard um, with the helmet and a full suit on. <laughs> So I got gray hair early watching him do this, but, but he did, he was very good at it. And eventually, it, oh, right. he helped design, help move forward the design of a helmet for this, for this sport. And eventually he now works in, in a company that manufactures and distributes this materials around the world. So he's an international mm -hmm. person for that. Um, so, and he does cross, he does um, backcountry skiing and mountain biking. So hopefully all of our outdoor activities were off on him, but, um, at any rate, so there is nature, and of course, the older I get, the restorative quality of nature, certainly during this pandemic, is incredibly important. I probably have walk, <clears throat> walked more during this pandemic because, you know, I happen to live in a part of San Francisco that has a um, park right, you know, like a minute from my house. So my friends and I have located all the places to park in San Francisco, I mean, to walk, and we, we go every day on different walks. But you mean you drive? What? Um, sometimes we walk, sometimes we drive. I, as I've mentioned before, my knees are older than the rest of me, so I can't walk long distances like I used to. But um, so, I mean, what's great is, for instance, the Great Highway in San Francisco is closed off to cars, so which is a great place to walk. Um, closed off because the sand dunes are drifting over to the highway. But there are all sorts of places. Um, mm -hmm. But the point all about all of that is that interest in nature made me more aware of the Sierra Club as the years went on. Um, when, did you join? When, did you, when, did, when did you decide to join the Sierra Club? I joined because I'm a good question. When I, um, when, uh, I worked, um, let me see, what happened was, well, after I, <clears throat> I worked as a social worker for a number of years in Los Angeles and Oakland, um, then worked at KQED as a producer on and off for news programming, cultural programming. Um, and then uh, I, from there, I went to the um, 10 years at the, um, uh, I mean, 13 years at Stanford University for a national public health program. I forgot to mention that. that is like, <laughs> small period of time. And that's a long period. Time. Um, I, I was one of the few non-academics, but it was a fascinating program to determine if you can and this all does eventually lead to the Sierra Club, but you know, it's, it's never a linear line for me how I got to where I am. It's one step after another. And I've been very lucky to have incredibly interesting jobs. But so the, the goal in this national program was to reduce mortality and morbidity of heart disease through the use of media and community organization. Um, having been uh, one of the first VISTA volunteers in Pennsylvania, I had some background in community organization and, um, you know, my background in social work helped, but and working at PBS, but um, our goal was uh, to develop community institutions, educational programs, and my part was to help develop um, in Spanish and English programs, radio and television, public service announcement, documentaries, news programs. I was not the creative person, but I was sort of the conduit between academia, um, the community, and um, the creative people. Mm -hmm. So that was an incredibly interesting job, and after uh, that funding ended after seven years or so. We worked with the California Department of Health Services in consulting on the anti-tobacco campaign in California. Anyway, and so on. So I was there for 13 years and it was really, it was so interesting. So what a second. So from Miami, you came, you went through sort of across the country, you came to Bay Area? No, 
to your late to your seventy. <laughs> you know, but it's it's probably yeah, it's it's too many uh, move, but, uh, moves. There are from the age of twenty one to I came here when I was twenty six. I was in many places, but after I was a Vista volunteer in Scranton, Pennsylvania, I moved to LA as a social worker, and then I lived abroad for a year, working as a governess in Paris. Um, and as a farm worker in Israel, and then just traveled all over. Um, I was gone about 10 months. So then I came back and worked in New York City for American Friends Service Committee. And then I moved to San Francisco. So uh, once I got here, I continued to do social work and then worked at uh, PBS and then at Stanford. Um, and after Stanford, that's when I got, um, got more or less connected eventually to Sierra Club because I worked for the American Lung Association, originally as director of communications but uh, eventually um, to public health policy. Um, I think it started because, just a minute. Mm -hmm. I think Cheers. it began. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't do that. Cheers. It's, Cheers. It's, it's tea, it's green tea, everybody. <laughs> no, no, don't confuse. <laughs> um, uh, there was a, someone, I, as I say, I work mostly in communications, but was a spokesperson for our state of the air uh, report, which is a national report, and that's sort of how I got interested in air quality because we used EPA data to determine the levels of ozone and particle matter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pollution in different cities around the United States. So that got me interested. Um, somebody in our office had a small grant for air quality work, and they left uh, maternity leave and gave me the project. And then things just started building. Um, I found it fascinating. Um, we worked, I, I don't know what came first because it was a number of years ago, but um, I started working on trying to reduce pollution from dirty diesel buses. I mean, this was in, I guess the eighties, nineties. Um, they, San Francisco still used very old dirty diesel buses, the kind that, you know, pollute black smoke. Black smoke. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the data, all the data shows that it's incredibly dangerous to anyone, but certainly of course, uh, in lower income communities, um, who live by refineries as well as dirty buses. But at any rate, we, um, uh, we ended up um, working on that. And because of that, uh, I think I wrote a couple letters to the editor. At any rate, we suddenly got a call one day from um, the San Francisco. First of all, I'm so I'm, I have to step back. There was a nonprofit philanthropical organization called Our Children's Earth, and they funded us first to work on the issue of dirty diesel buses. And they actually had money to hire a campaign organizer. And I worked with him. It was a long haul. We eventually put a um, policy on the ballot and it passed. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a long haul. We did it, it worked. And so the buses took some time but the buses eventually were phased out. So, so when, which that, year, what, part, when was that? When was that? Which year was that? Uh, I don't remember exactly. I think it was sometime in the early 1990s. Um, so, 30 years ago, 31, 30. Just, you know, I'm just sort of thinking, it's like we're still fighting similar fights. Right. You know, Bavaria might be ahead of the curve, but but in many places. So it's it's interesting, 30 years later, and we still- sort No, of you're still right. And, and it didn't happen. I mean, that's a good point. And it didn't happen overnight. You know, yeah. it, it took a while till they phased out the buses. Um, and we tried to do it in East Bay as well. I mean, it, it's so interesting how environmental issues work because at that time, the mm -hmm. only- uh, I wouldn't say the only, but one of the few advantage, uh, one of the few alternatives to diesel was they were just starting on electric cars and electric buses. At that time, it was natural gas, which of course now we're trying to phase out of. So, um, which was at least in that level better than diesel, which was really toxic. I remember driving behind diesel buses in Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco um, and uh, Anyway, driving, there's a refinery flaring accident happened as we were talking, wow. Um, those kind of things happened all the time, the refinery flaring as well as the diesel buses. We drove behind those buses one day, you could just see all of the black smoke. So at that time, clean air gas was the alternative. Um, you know, obviously we're in a different phase now. Um, well, electric yesterday I just, uh, you know, heard that EPA is rolling back the regulations. I know. It's just terrible. And it, you know, the, fun, the interesting part is that all, you know, most, a lot of big uh, companies, oil and fossil fuel companies actually are objecting to that rollback of the rules. And they want those regulations and they touting as a, we helping small 
businesses. It's just so terrible. No, anyway. it, it's unbelievable. A lot, a lot of the issues I worked on and many others, it's all being rolled back. It's just insane. But anyway, um, moving forward. <laughs> So it's just so interesting how it was diesel and we switched to natural gas and now we're going to more electric. But at that time, that was a cleaner alternative from a health viewpoint. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I'm trying, I can't think of the sequence of events, but um, I did write this down someplace. But um, at that time- You came prepared with notes. Um, I, I think it was time for me. <laughs> I worked, worked on so many different campaigns. Um, it did. That's true. That, and that's why it's difficult for me to remember. I was like, because you you have really such a diverse experience. So, and I, you know, we were talking about which was, which was more sort of your favorite or most, you know, enlightening or something, but we, we can get to it later. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, they're in a way they all build on each other. Um, we also remember another interesting experiment we did with a scientist from NRDC. Uh, we were trying to get cleaner school buses. It's uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, uh, one of the scientists had a sort of a jury, jury rig Geiger counter, and we went into school buses, and the level of diesel was off the charts. And these are with children. So we also had a campaign to work with that. That was harder to work with because um, that was all privately owned. Um, I mean, eventually they did, and now there's coming to be more electric school buses. But we're so that. What, well, how, how did you, how were you able to actually turn that campaign so it actually um, Well, we didn't, you know, we just, we just kept pressure on them. The diesel industry made sure, didn't make our job easy. I'll just say that. Um, and we did meet in the East Bay, for instance, we met in a number of city council meetings trying to convince them. In some cases it worked and in some places they screamed at us, but um, but anyway, we were successful in San Francisco, as I say, it took a number of years for it to get together, but for it to actually happen. But at this point, um, we had enough press that I got a call one day from the San Francisco Foundation asking if um, they would fund us to start uh, a coalition to keep up this work. So um, we, I hired an intern and we figured out who we were gonna have on the group and we worked with, um, it's called the Bay Area Clean Air Task Force. And what made it, interesting and successful. It was a combination of um, uh, environmental groups, Sierra Club, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, UCS, Union of Concerned Scientists, Friends of the Earth. There's a number of people came and went, but those are the main ones. Um, public health organizations, <clears throat> American Lung Association, a group called RAMP, which was RAS, uh, Regional Asthma Management, Management Program, um, and then environmental groups that came and went, but primarily <clears throat> excuse me, the Bayview Hunters Point Community Advocates. Um, for a while, Communities for a Better Environment. For a while, we had uh, West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. So, which, you know, so all of those groups together was really helpful. We would also not only work on getting rid of the Bayview, as many groups did, the Bayview Hunters Point um, Dirty Power Plant. And we continued on the issue of diesel buses and school buses. Um, but it was really, um, that, that group, by the way, uh, expanded with another grant from the San Francisco Foundation, um, which formed something called the Bay Area Environmental Health Collaborative, BAEHC. I'm not sure if they're still going, but that took in a lot more East Bay groups. Mm -hmm. um, so through my um, work with, um, with, with that issue, in addition to working on air quality, and, and as I say, I was a spokesperson for state of the air reports. So constantly being besieged by media, the report came out one day every year. So I did a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of news conferences about, about the air quality. And San Francisco usually got good air quality um, in ozone, but bad in particular matter. But of course we can't rest in our laurels in San Francisco because the West prevailing winds push it towards the East Bay. Sorry, <laughs> but. No. It's absolutely true. I mean, West Oakland is horribly affected. Obviously, you know, at some point, I actually <clears throat> used to live in uh, in Jack London's area, and I looked at the <clears throat> uh, air quality maps. I was terrified. Honestly, I, I, it was it was horrible. One one of the worst places in the country 
you know, West Auckland, that whole in Jack London. It's it's a little bit better now because the transition to to you know uh, track retrofits, which was also you know another story of how labor and and environmental groups should work together and make sure that people have resources to retrofit and to make right. changes. So that that. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it, it happened and the air in West Oakland, obviously helping. But again, we are fighting coal now, you know, who would have right. thought? Right. 2020, That's... right? So it's ridiculous. But anyway, back to San Francisco, so where are you pushing on us? <laughs> well, you know, no, it's interesting you say that because all of those things, it's, it's just ongoing. It never stops. Um, you know, actually, I, I think one of the first times I got really clued into what was going in the East Bay was a woman named Margaret Gordon. I went to a, she's a community activist. I'm sure we all know Margaret. And I went to um, a state level, um, I don't know, workshop on environmental justice. And she got up and spoke um, about the fact that every single, she was on the, she lives on the route to the Oakland port. And mm -hmm. that every single morning she had to wipe off like inches of um, diesel fuel from her windowsill and, and that her whole family had asthma. And I just thought no one should have to live like that. And yeah. it's interesting because we, we tried very hard to work with the truckers to change the route. Mm -hmm. I think eventually they didn't manage to change the route, but nonetheless, I remember we had a news conference in the open port. Mm -hmm. And it, by the time we left, we could hardly talk because it was so polluted. It was, you could just feel it in your lungs. And I couldn't imagine people living there, but living yeah. close by, but they do. And that's the well, issue. People don't have a choice, you right. know? Exactly. People, especially, you know, I can speak for myself. So like, it's not like I can just pick up and move somewhere. If if I have a house or rent a house, you know, if you in certain socioeconomic demographic, it's, like, it's not that easy. So people don't have choices, and that's why we do have to continue the fight to make sure that every place is safe to live you know I, I had a conversation with hop and and he is talking hop hopkins from the national sierra club but he the, you know as we know sierra club is really spearheading the the um rectification movement and um he, you know he talks all the time there's no disposable you know disposable um uh, places without disposable people and we need to really get present to that so why are we allowing some places to be polluted and some people go through those environmental disasters so um anyway but yes uh, it's it the fight goes on or i would Let's say the, the work, I, I think what is interesting in your work that it's sort of, I, the way I see it, it's sort of spark here, spark there, and then you work with communities and different organizations to kind of bring it together and mobilize and create a movement that creates sort of structure that could more effectively and powerfully address right. all of those issues and be really powerful right. uh, lobbying advocacy force so you know it just shows we, we have to work together <laughs> oh no, it does because that's that's the that's the key point um and we also I forgot to mention worked uh tried to change poly policy at the bay area environment um bay area air quality management district um I, you know i was on the advisory council for a while but nonetheless we often testified there um and to change policies in terms of the the refineries, mm -hmm. um, because it's just unconscionable that not just in the Bay Area, but particularly in Houston, you know, all around the U.S., always low-income communities, primarily communities of color, and it's just completely unjust. So we did testify there, and sometimes we were successful, sometimes not. Um, I remember one time testifying, and uh, about some. I think it was it was about global warming issues because. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. We also worked a lot on global warming uh, issues. I did with the Lung Association, but um, we testified. I think the Air Quality Board was going to uh, was putting putting forth a policy to charge just a small amount of money, um, and I may not have this quite right to the um, to the refineries for each pound or whatever it was that they exuded in terms of greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. And I testified to that effect. And some woman next to me said, "Can I have your card?" And I gave her to. I didn't think about it. The next morning, my uh, stepdaughter called and said, have you seen the page cover of the Chronicle? And there I was on the front page of the Chronicle. Not my face, but just a... So, and I think I had said was, it's going to be more costly 
to not find, to not lower greenhouse gases. We'll pay for it. And if you're worried about money, I mean, I said a little more articulately than that, but so that was really interesting. Um, she was from the New York Times. That so was the New York Times as well. But um, anyway, the point was that we had a lot of issues to work on. I think we did some successful things, but obviously it, it has to be constant. Um, and I think even when I was in the Sierra Club, uh, Minda and I went and testified a couple of times. I know there's some people on the um, board who are still very involved in that. And I'm really pleased about that. Uh, but I was gonna say, I also uh, got involved in climate change issues. Um, I had the woman that I worked for at the American Lung Association was a wonderful woman. She had, I think she had actually worked at Sierra Club for like 10 years long before, but she was a director of, her name is Bonnie Holmes Jen, and she was the director of um, air quality for the state, for the Lung Association in California. And when we would go lobby in the halls of, uh, you know, Sacramento, people knew her, respected her greatly. So I learned a lot from her. Um, but we started out originally, we had a few small grants and then they got bigger, but we worked on, I forget, it was AB 1437 or something. The first uh, climate change law put forth by Fran Paddley to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles. Um, worked on a lot of regulations related to uh, air quality. My job um, was to work with public health professionals to um, have them sign group letters to speak at news conferences, to testify at public hearings, um, to be the expert that people could, could go to um, about the public health impacts of global warming. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. Uh, and I'm, I learned a lot. I'm curious because, you know, I think we're talking a lot, um, which I, I, I'm very happy that we are uh, about lobbying and about advocacy and about the importance of, of talking to elected officials. I, I have to say that the highlight not only elected but appointed officials right. that who make decisions for all of us that right. we affect us every right. day. So, you know, if you can give a few, because you talked about Bonnie, and I'm curious, what was she doing that made her be so well-respected and so effective. So uh, especially um, now, she left it. <laughs> she actually left it a few years ago, but I think she had been there at Lung Association for, I don't know, 25 years at least. But she knew the science as stronger than anybody in relation to clean air. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, and she had been there long enough that she knew, with a, you know, it's also personal. I mean, she knew the staff for a lot of people and she knew some of the legislators. She had the science behind her. The thing that I helped to bring along, and it was her, partly her, definitely her idea, bring along the public health professionals and also add the community component. So that when we testified on issues, we had people from the community talking about the direct impacts, doctors talking about the cases they saw, you know, in addition to all the science. So the idea was to let, let people know what we always knew, which was that at the end of the line, it affects people's lives. And we had all the data on how many heart disease and lung disease and when you look in the um, state of the art uh, book that comes out every year, it gives you a list in all the counties around cities, almost all the cities in the US. Um, it gives you information about the number of heart disease and lung, you know, uh, asthma and so forth. It gives you all those rates. So, the, and the fact that she had been there a long time. And so she was really respected in that, in that regard. Um, and so she, I learned a lot from her about um, climate change. And of course the peak of all of that, we worked a lot on regulations to reduce um, emissions from diesel, from trucks. A lot of truck, mm -hmm. trying to switch out of diesel into cleaner trucks and trying to get subsidies for small truck drivers who couldn't do it. Um, there was a lot of air quality regulations that we worked on, um, but probably the most, um, and also the other thing was we worked in Central Valley since it was um, American Lung Association, it was California. Um, there, as you know, Central Valley has enormous pollution from, you know, methane farms, from a million highways, you know, freeways going through it. Um, and farm, farm, farming also, right? Yeah, from dairy farms and, you know, tractors and trucks and highways. It's really a, so we worked, um, there were some people there who did tremendous work and we worked with them as much as we could. So it was a, a real education. Um, and probably the most interesting thing we worked on was the passage of AB 32, which is California's global warming law. So, and that was really working with public health professionals to get them to sign on to, you know, to negotiate. Um, the one battle we did lose was I think when the signing came, um, 
I think it was, uh, well, Fran Pebley and Fabio, Fabio Nunez were involved in all of this, who were the legislators, but um, we wanted to have a carbon tax. So there was a real fight between carbon tax and, mm. you know, and trade, um, the tax. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what am I trying to say? I, you know, the, what, uh, the carbon tax of car cap and trade. Cap and trade, right. So I'm sorry. But um, so that was a real battle. Um, eventually the cap and trade went out, but you know, Bonnie and I went with a number of other people to Treasure Island when the when the uh, bill was signed. So that that was a hard struggle. And what won that battle was an enormous amount of organization from many many different constituencies throughout the state. There was you know like a a group that worked in faith groups, a group that worked with truck drivers, a group that worked with public health organizations, a group that worked with churches. I mean, there must have been twenty different coalitions. It was really well organized. So that was a big battle. Um, I have goosebumps you talking about it, and I have goosebumps because it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Well, it, it really was a wave, and it's such a you know, prominent legislation in California that affected so many, you know, how the state is really right. developing in many ways. So, and, and the interesting parts that I, <clears throat> I think that, you know, I reiterate all the time personal relationships, taking time to get to know people, take time right. to know what what their problems concerns right. are what they do, and addressing them you know and also connecting to the personal stories because behind every heart attack behind every lung disease is a real person is a real community is a real family real pain real struggle so you know those numbers if they just spoken people just glaze over them but you really have to bring people who live that and let people know, legislators know, decision makers know that that's that's your decision. What are you going to decide to let those people suffer? Are you going to change something? You know, so th th those I think are important lessons that I hear from you. That that you know we need to. You're there exactly are a lot of but, but yeah. you're exactly right. Also, good organizing is also is like I need to take a class and organizing, even though I did it sort of on the job, but. <laughs> um, there was something else I wanted to say, but I forget. Um, I love it that you have notes. That's it. I, I can't remember all the things I did. Oh, I know what I was going to say. The, the most important thing to tie this together was that from a personal note, um, you know, I was, as years have gone on, I'm becoming more understanding the restorative nature of of, uh, of, um, of nature, the restorative quality of nature. But so that was interesting to me in the Sierra Club. But, you know, environmental justice brought forth the nexus between the environment and the community and racial justice and social justice. So that was what really interested me is making sure that everyone can be safe from disease caused by pollution and also hopefully have access to nature as well. Um, so that was why I really enjoyed what I was doing because, and exactly what you said, it, the goal was to make legislators realize that policy has a real impact. It's not just the words that you say, it's that it can change people's lives dramatically. So, um, and then since I've been retired, I retired in the middle of 2009, retired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've managed, so then, then the, the man that I was friends with who got me, who brought Sierra Club to the coalition we worked on mm -hmm. um, after, shortly after I retired, he um, asked me to serve in the executive committee of San Francisco, which I did. Um, mm -hmm. But Thank also, you. pardon? Thank you. <laughs> no, you're welcome. Thank him. Um, uh, the other thing was that, um, you know, when I first moved to San Francisco, as I say, my former husband and I were um, social workers, so we didn't have much money, but we moved to a neighborhood. I wanted to live in a neighborhood that was mixed ethnically and, you know, we didn't have much money. So we moved to a really interesting neighborhood um, in San Francisco, which, of course, 20 years later is completely gentrified. But the point was we bought our home years ago, which is how I managed to do all these nonprofit jobs and survive. Um, and then <clears throat> when we decided to have a child, we built a second story. So. The point of all of that was after I retired, um, because I love travel, I've got the Jones for travel and I had for many years, I've traveled to many countries. Um, having this home, now that my son was at college, I rented out a room 
and uh, use that money to travel to far and distant lands. So, and, and certainly um, help to ease the, uh, the, the joy I had in traveling and seeing nature and seeing indigenous culture. So, I mean, nature, it's like, um, I went snorkeling in the Red Sea. Uh, you know, I uh, went snorkeling in the Galapagos Islands with the sea lions. I went snorkeling in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean in Zanzibar. Um, and snorkeling in Mexico several times. Um, saw the thunderous beauty of Iguazu Falls in Argentina and Brazil. Um, I can't remember, there were so many things. I went rafting, never been rafting. I went rafting in these rapids in New Zealand where they shot Lord of the Rings or something in New Zealand and also uh, went traveled to Midford Sound in New Zealand. Um, I was asked at one point to do workshops in Kathmandu and Chiang Mai in Nepal, uh, in different trips in Nepal and Thailand about using media to change human behavior. Um, so Ooh, I want to hear that. <laughs> How do you change human behavior? Yeah, I <laughs> well, very simple. You ask the people who, who had the most impact from, from pollution um, and from disastrous policies, what, you know, you ask, literally, like, I'm here, when, when I first went to Stanford, here's an example, they showed me um, a video of uh, one of the professors, he was in this very white room, and he was very pale, and he was talking about all the data and statistics and why it was important to help people, and blah, 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 but you know, this was going to be for Monterey and Salinas, which was our test communities. And when it was over, it was like, what would, what would you do? I couldn't say I would throw that out and start over again. So I, they said, how would you make this different? But you have to know who your audience is. So one of the things I would do that, first of all, you shoot something in the community, not in some room at Stanford, uh, into recognizable venues. <clears throat> you use people from the community often, you know, if you're going to a Latino community, you know, obviously you, you ask, you know, what are the, we had a lot of focus groups to find out before we, we didn't send anything to an ad agency. We had a lot of groups where we would ask people saying, um, what are the most important, what would make you change? What would make you stop smoking? What would make you change your diet? What would make you exercise? What are the things that you think is important? Um, and we, and then we sometimes shot uh, rough cuts, very inexpensive rough cuts, and we'd go back and test them. And we learned a lot. Um, we worked with what made it easier. We worked with news stations to do series on quitting smoking and eating and exercise, all of that. And, you know, it helped because I was on staff and I knew how to do that. So I, I could help them set up. So you need it. It's like in the same way in the Bay Area Clean Air Task, you need something, someone dedicated. It's not that I'm so terrific. Anyone could do it, but you need someone who can guide the program through. So, um, you know, we shot documentaries taking people from the local community. I love the fact we had a great um, Spanish language producer originally from Argentina, Roberto, who um, we had this uh, telenovelas. We actually went out to the lettuce fields one day. We met with the people there, but he had this great imagination and it was Chef Romero and everybody in Chef Romero's family had some health issues. So we had dramatic segments every, every week about how you could make your diet better or quit smoking, but it was all in Spanish, obviously, and geared towards the Latino community. So, or Latinx, as I should say. Um, so, you know, the point is, and I, I remember once I was sent to a major conference and, um, and all these ad people showed their fabulous ads, you know, these national ads and whatever it was, and everybody clapped, they were terrific. And then I got up to speak. And of course those ads cost like $2 million to produce a piece. I didn't say that, but I just said, how many of you were from health departments? You know, half of them raised their hands and I said, so I knew that they didn't have much money. So I talked to them about how you produce these things and on little money and how you get news coverage out of this. Anyway, so that was- How do you? Really how do you? I want to know how, how do you? <laughs> well, you have to make the news. I mean, remember now, it's different now because when I did it, it was all broadcast media. It was Spanish and radio, uh, Spanish and English radio and television. Um, so there were dedicated channels and there wasn't social media. So I, you know, it's a whole new world. And I, I can't, I mean, I don't mean to sound stupid, but I wouldn't know where to begin, but. It's moving so fast in, in, oh boy, I'm, right. I'm definitely, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna mention Virginia, you know, helping us think so, so much because I'm also like, how do you use Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> Behind the scenes, I'm not there yet, so. Well, I also, I, 
I worked on the issues, the principles of social marketing and media advocacy. And social marketing was taking the principles of general advertising. If you, you know, if you can sell toothpaste, you can sell health behavior. And that's what I'm saying, you know, asking the, the people involved, using people involved, oftentimes, not all the time, but we use testimonials, we used humor, um, you know, we used people who were from the community. So that really worked uh, a lot. But basically, you rely on data from the community. You don't just send things off to an ad agency. Uh, media advocacy was um, using the media to change public health advocacy. And I have to give enormous credit to the Department of Health Services in California for their tobacco ad campaign. And what they did was completely flip it from the, you know, quote, the victim who smoked, you need to stop smoking, to you were being manipulated by the tobacco industry. And that was a major shift in, um, in how public health campaigns worked. So, so what I did was after um, I worked with, I was a consultant, I didn't do any of the production, but I was a consultant with different communities. Um, and some of it was divided up between there was the Asian American caucus and Latina caucus and African American caucus. And so we worked with all of those groups and, um, you know, help them not be manipulated by the tobacco industry. And clearly California made some success because the rate went down. So. Of course, now it's unfortunately all the so-called vice uh, industries are making their like 40% increase. And I know. It's terrible. And, but, but, you know, I think that in, in a circumstance like that, I can't, I, how can you blame people we don't have, you know, I think we need to think about how, how can we substitute those harmful things right. for something more healthy and pleasant. And, and I think that, you know, I, I went to a, a sustainable MBA program um, and, and something that really stuck with me because I was always drawn to marketing and um, uh, partially because it's psychology, marketing and psychology. And I think that the environmental movement and democratic movement, honestly, could probably utilize some of those skills because you really need to tap into human emotion. Exactly. You know, those one ad, I don't know if Oreo cookie, it's, it's an Oreo cookie, okay, but they have a um, grandfather with a grandchild dipping the cookie in one mil, you know, glass of milk and the, this amazing feeling that it creates. And that's what it's all about. It's not about the product. It's about what kind of feelings and right. visual uh, sensation, uh, visuals and sensations that it wakes in you. So I think that environmental movement could definitely implement some of those sort of what are we building towards, not just what we're fighting, but what is the vision that is it the vision that not mothers don't have to worry about any toys that they buy for their children. They know that everything that they buy is healthy and good right. or food or anyway, I, I'm going on a tangent here, but I really no, true. I mean, I remember one time we tested some nutrition spot. I forget what it was. I think it was a, a child holding a stethoscope to their parents stomach and saying, daddy, this is not good for you. You need to change your diet, blah, blah, blah. And so the people in the focus group said, I don't want my kid act telling me that. I don't like that. So so a lot of times we changed based on what we said, but based on what the feedback we got. But um, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's why we used, we used testimonials a fair amount. You know, we worked on issues of weight control when we had a bunch of people and we shot in locations, um, as I say, in Salinas and Monterey, this was in Monterey, in places where people knew it was Monterey. And we had real people saying things like, I never thought I could lose weight, but I did X, Y, Z, and I did. So a number of different people. Um, you know, and also a lot of people, I, this goes back to what you said, would change your behavior based on if the little girl said, I don't like it when my mommy smokes because I know it's not good for her and I don't like to smell the smoke. So, you know, anyway, there's a lot of ways to make a message that can be effective without. A lot of, yeah, a lot of times I think we're not going to change our behavior because of ourselves, even though, you know, love uh, the neighbor, uh, thy neighbor is yourself. We don't love ourselves a lot of times but we will change our behavior or do something because of people right. that we love right. you know, right. no, it's like a lot you know so sort of um that that string today <laughs> philosophical but you know, it's the, very helpful because the you know, issue, i'm sorry the larger issue is not just changing the behavior but institutionalizing that because wow. when we got 
you know, this was Stanford and they were very good at epidemiology. So, I mean, included on, um, you know, there was epidemi, we work with epidemiologists, psych psychologists, um, you know, PhDs in science and whatever. Everybody was very well educated and had their, had their own field. But um, so, the, so the point is we had, we took a lot of studies and we did see the rate of smoking go down. We saw the rate of, um, uh, you know, rate of exercise go up. We saw diet changes. Uh, you know, cholesterol, we measured cholesterol. This was by the end of the study, but what was more important was how do you sustain that behavior over a 10 year period? Part of what we did was to try to institutionalize these, these changes. And I'm, I'm saying this, that I think the environmental community can learn from a lot of these things. Yeah. And so to try to institutionalize these behaviors, we did some things like, um, we had started exercise competitions between workplaces. So we try to- well, Nothing like a competition, right? right? <laughs> So we tried to get people to retain that. We also, um, oh, I left them all the PSA, you know, I left them a million videos. This was videos, you know, they could use, but um, we made sure that smoking programs, the kind we use were institutionalized. We, we, oh, we worked in hospitals and exercise programs. And, you know, so we tried to leave as much behind, but, you know, I haven't, I know that there was some data afterwards that showed the decline and the bad habits succeeded, but who knows if it happens now? I mean, it has to be a, a constant thing and well because we're against a lot of companies who are constantly you know advancing in the they, they invest millions and billions in in psychology psychological research and manipulation of mind period and it's, it's, it's not you know, study after study um uh, about that but but this is such a um enlightening concept for me you're right maybe i articulated the different but but the institution in, in, in uh, i cannot pronounce that word but in i know what you mean <laughs> institution <laughs> institutionalizing that's right oh sometimes those <laughs> english becomes difficult but um that that's such a great um point because you really have to put some you know um some some things in place so other people can come behind you and implement them or you know have a base to start from so so yes that's that's incredible the problem with nonprofits for all of us i mean no matter what your area of expertise is um, is that nonprofits for the most part i mean what you would really for instance it'd be great to have someone in the Sierra club that worked you know half time in environmental justice or any nonprofit to continue those causes because it's really hard to keep to keep coalitions going unless there's someone to really sort of steer the ship, so to speak. But, you know, I mean, I, working for the, uh, being on the executive committee has been um, a really interesting project. I'm glad I did it. Um, and uh, I'm sure I'll, even though I'm leaving. Don't tell me you're considering leaving. I don't want to hear that for sure. <laughs> I don't, uh, I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs> I, pretend I didn't hear anything. I don't want to, I don't want to hear that. Um, well, but also we have staff who are, you know, right. wonderful members who are doing that work uh, do. day in and out, you know, our organizers and so, so, it, yeah, so it's, you yeah, do have, you good, I want to say you do have good staff. I really appreciate the staff. Yeah, yeah, no, it is so, so, but you're absolutely right. The, they're, um, what are the lessons? I mean, what do you think should be done to advance those conversations to, to have, sort of what kind of results do we have to go after in your view and and how to advance this work? Well, I, I think given the political climate in the country now, until we know what's happening in November, I think we probably need to work more at the state and local level. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, it's, it's I'm, I'm repeating what I said, but no matter what the issue is, and um, certainly in environmental justice, I'm interested in working, you know, in uh, and air quality and air in you know working you know and also ga gas is being phased out a little bit as time goes on to making sure refinery flaring as we just saw doesn't continue it really impacts the fence line communities um so you know it'd be great to follow have someone follow specific ej issues and to do it more locally um and to do it in a in a coalescing force i know that um they did work on that in the coal issue um, that the group was very successful until now there's what some now it's up in the air again. Yeah. I mean, it's hard you're working against such incredible forces of power and money. But um, nonetheless, I guess it's just 
change takes a long time, but at the risk of sounding 100% cliche, you can't give up as long as you keep pushing that Sisyphean rock up the hill, someday you'll get there, but you can't give up because too many people's lives literally depend on it. Um, and it's, it's a good you know, segue because I want to know what have you been doing because you've been in, engaged and involved in so many campaigns. And so, I mean, I'm sure they're gonna be, you know, there were some pains and heartbreaks and, and tremendous hours that you spend working. So what some practices, what techniques did you implement in your life to sustain yourself mentally and physically and um, that other people could probably try and implement? Well, uh, nothing terribly original, but from a personal point of view, there were two things that brought me great satisfaction. One was I said travel um, and even doesn't have to be international, but um, anywhere, <laughs> uh, anywhere where nature is. Um, and the other one is just, uh, for me, it was <laughs> dance classes. I took um, dance classes for 21 years. I had to stop because as I say, my knees are older than, than I am, but we danced to music from different countries, Senegal, Cuba, India, Ireland, hip hop, jazz, whatever. And um, so we did, I did that. They have a great organization in San Francisco called Rhythm and Motion. And I did that for 17 years, to three times a week. And then for the next three years, the next four years, one, one time a week. And finally, I just had to stop. But um, it's tremendous. It's a definition of fun. So that, that was great. And I wasn't bad. <laughs> um, so that I think the th things that keep me going are did keep me was that um, staying close to nature and not forgetting. Not forgetting gratitude for myself so that that pushes me on to make things better for other people. I'm retired now, but I have a pension. I have this house that I bought years ago, which costs nothing. But um, and that is why a lot of what I do is part of what a million other people are doing is writing postcards. Um, about to get people out to vote. It's, it's a, we work in coordination with NAACP, but it's, and, and with other groups. So I think you've got to be engaged. You've got to be engaged to help those who can't, um, whether hopefully it's on the environmental issue, if not other issues, but at some point they're all entwined. That's very true. But the, this is amazing to say gratitude because you, I think you're right, especially now the, the, things that sometimes yank me. I mean, I, I'm pretty good, actually. I do really devote a lot of time to make sure that I meditate, that I take care of myself after being completely burned out to the crisp. <laughs> um, it's just so important because I see so many activists who are coming to meetings and they're tired and they're frustrated and they 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 burned out completely and because we're working on issues that are really not fun a lot of times so self-care i think is just absolutely tremendous and and part of that self-care i think you're absolutely right is gratitude and just recognizing you know what even if it's smallest thing you know you w woke up in the morning right. you can be grateful for that a lot of people did not so you know you have your friends or family or you good health anyway yeah, I can go on and on about that, but that's that's. Thank you for mentioning that. I think that's tremendous. And dancing, oh god, <laughs> well, well, dancing. also, um, it's one of the best uh, exercises for mind and body. They do the same thing because when you're learning uh, right. movement, right. the whole system is engaged. So right. it, it's a great, great exercise overall. Yeah. Sorry, so you, you were. Uh -huh. no, I was just going to say, so it's very odd for me to talk about myself so much. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And since we don't have time, after then, 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 we'll go out for a drink. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, hey, I still drink red wine, not vodka. But, you know, you were talking about so many interesting things, you know, the, the not scuba diving. I, I haven't scuba dived, but snorkeling. No, that's snorkeling. So I couldn't do the snorkeling. What, are, what is your favorite? What is your favorite? Is like, what is your no, favorite I experience? Probably, there's no favorites, but I would say of all the trips I've taken recently, probably the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania. I mean, okay. just from the nature, just to see massive amounts of mammals, you know, animals wandering across 7,000 acres, you know, wildebeest and giraffe and elephants and gazelles and I don't know, and leopards and hyenas. And it just is amazing to see that. Um, so that I, was 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I would love to go there. Yeah. So that was that was quite incredible. And, you know, visiting a Maasai warrior village and um, and from there we went to Zanzibar, but um, where we did snorkeling. But that was an amazing trip. Um, you know, just seeing a lot of the natural wonder of the world. I recently came back from uh, right before the pandemic began from Vietnam and Cambodia. So Angkor Wat does not disappoint. Um, it is jaw dropping, but I mean, I, and there are many others. I made a list at one point of all the different places. I can't remember, but. I want um, that list. I'm creating the list of all the places I eventually want to make too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it's just, you're right. We are, unfortunately are coming to time. And um, what, what did I not ask maybe that, that you would like to share or. Oh, um, okay. So let me see. I found some. Um, uh, well, I would just say at one point, you know, who, it, who influenced me, at least in terms of environmental issues, in terms of thinkers, um, probably, this is from, you know, when I started in the 1990s, um, uh, James Hansen, um, Bill McKibben, Elizabeth Colbert um, from, the, from the New Yorker, but they all, I, I heard Bill McKibben and James Hansen speak as well as in, you know, lecture series and um, and I read some of their articles, but they were really influ uh, influential. The other thing is when I first started working on global warming, I don't think this still exists. I Googled it to find out there was some website called Above the Fold. And what they did was take headlines from around the world. Mm -hmm. And you could see the extreme weather and global warming impacts. And it, it, you know, after looking at that, there was no question we were on a path to destruction. So that was really interesting to me. Um, but in general, those are the thinkers that I look at. And, you know, I think Colbert's book about six extinction is, is imperative. I mean, we have to pay attention. It's, it's, uh, it's the most timely issue we have right now. I mean, next to pandemic and economic crisis and racial justice, but. Well, and you're right. I think everything links together. Everything. It's, it's all connected. And that's the thing you realize as this pandemic goes on, but, you know. Like Hope springs eternal, so let's hope. That's right. Hope and act, I think. Yes, hope exactly. Hope and act. No, you have to act. You can't just complain. You have to write letters. You have to show up. I think John Lewis said that. It's you have to show up oh. in order to change things. You can't just complain. No whining. No. I agree. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm totally taking you up on that drink. I can come to San Francisco, <laughs> to, you know, mask or, I don't know, straw, whatever, whatever we decide to do. I would love that. So thank you so much. Incredible. I think that the, your life is a legacy and I appreciate you doing all this work and, and putting yourself on the line continuously. So thank you so much. Thank Linda. you. Appreciate thank you, Olga. And thanks to the Sierra Club. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Please join me next Friday. We will attempt to start promptly at noon. So, and then you can always um, uh, see the recordings of those videos, conversations, and also we have a podcast. So please tune in. Thank you so much and have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.